<laughs> there are a few more people we're waiting for, but we might as well get started with the introduction. Um, welcome, everybody, to uh, our second lecture. Um, the Saga Heritage Foundation has uh, lectures in spring and in the fall, so we have three in each season. Um, this evening's guest speaker is Mr. Ron Page. Uh, who will take us on a journey in time in the search of the famous Aero Aero. Uh, Mr. Page is known for his four books on Canadian aviation history, uh, The Canuck, um, a book about the Avro CF-100 interceptor fleet, The Flying Years, a uh, story about fleet aviation, Minarski's Lang, a book about two aircraft flown by um, Canadian Victoria Cross winner, <coughs> Minarski, uh, Mr. Page has another book coming uh, out in the fall of 2002 in September, and it's called The History of the Avro Canada Aircraft and Oranda Engines, their aircraft and engines 1938 to 2000, and it will be published by the Boston Press. Uh, Mr. Page was a pilot during the World War II when he flew parachute drops in the Himalayas. Um, he also flew speed, uh, Spitfires and um, Glasser Meteor. Uh, one of the first jet fighters um, in 1949 and 1950s. Mr. Page graduated as an aeronautical engineer and worked on the Bristol Olympus engine that powers the Concorde to this day. Um, in 1954, he immigrated from England to Canada and worked at the Orenda engines. Uh, today, also part of the Magellan Aerospace, where he worked on the Iroquois jet that was to have powered the Evro Aero. Um, I have to read this because it's <laughs> too technical for me, I suppose. Um, without further ado, I'll let Mr. Page push the button on the time machine. So. Thank you. Nice small audience. Can you hear me? All right. Yeah. Um, I don't mind you if you ask a question as I go through while the slide is up. Uh, as we go through the various decades of the oh, we'll get the arrow. But before I do that, who goes into trivia here? Who knows what a nanosecond is? Oh, a nanosecond. Is that a million of a second? No. Something like that. Four thousand. Maybe it's a billion. A billion. Okay. okay. You ever seen a nanosecond? Fifteen zero. It just went by. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a nanosecond. That's eleven point eight inches. That's how fast electricity travels in one nanosecond. That's why you have small computers. It's thirty centimeters or eleven point eight inches. That's how fast it travels. So the closer you get here components together, the faster your computer is. This was uh, produced by Sheridan College, where my wife was working. Uh, Grace Hopper was the original inventor of this ruler. Uh, she wanted to demonstrate to her engineers what a nanosecond was. Technically, uh, I'm more confident to speak on uh, can-do power active fuels, because I spent most of my life in that uh, industry, uh, developing the power reactor fuel, the can do. But I switched to writing books, which I never, never thought I'd do, but I used to hate writing technical lectures uh, on can do. Um, we're going to go back to 1938 and start of um, the story. It is where National Steel Car Company decided to diversify and build its first plant at Moulton in 1938. At that time, Moulton was not yet a full international airport. It was only just being developed. And from that small beginning, so the growth of the um, aircraft industry at Moulton grew. Now, how do I operate the lights? <laughs> Ah. <laughs> and so um, in 1938, 
the um, National Steel Car Company had the aircraft division. They got order for Lysanders. And it's the Western Lysander, it's an English aircraft. And in the RAF, we used to say there used to be Lysanders and other aircraft because you'd always distinguish Lysander and all the other aircraft cut harder. Um, in 38, the uh, wing commander Whittle was also developing the jet engine. Uh, hadn't got it really going at, at that point. He had the first W1 operating. And the first Lysander flew in 1939 in August, just before the war was declared in September. Um, At the same time in 1939, uh, we also had the uh, British Commonwealth Air Training Plan defined, which then demanded a terrific number of aircraft uh, to be built in Canada, as England could not support it. Beside Lysanders, they got into the Hamden program, Andy Page Hamden, I won't go into that in detail of that, plus wings for Hanson, from Assembly of Hanson, the training aircraft, as well as Harvard's. When the war in France, the collapse of France, the Yale aircraft they ordered, uh, of course, could not be delivered. And so we pinched them from Canada by towing across the border by horses and had to convert them. Now, the Yale's rather a queer aircraft. It's uh, what we call a poor man's harbor. It, but the French, no matter why, had the throttle closing as you push it forward and opening as you pull it back. And of course, all the incitation was metric and that all had to be converted. Kind of a dangerous thing to fly. Now, if I can press the right thing here. This uh, <coughs> Lysander uh, was restored by Captain Bernie Lapointe for his uh, export project. It is now in the uh, National Aviation Museum. Um, I'm going to jump ahead a wee bit. Uh, from 39 to 1940 <coughs> to 41, there was a number of things going on. Number one, I went across the Atlantic on a troop ship as a teenager with my family, and so I ended up in England in the blackout and Russian. Also in 1940, C.D. Howe was appointed Minister of Munitions and Supply. Now, a lot of people don't give C.D. Howe credit how he turned our country from an agricultural-based economy into the industrial base we have today. Without the industry we have today, we couldn't have all the services we so uh, commonly expect, such as Medicare and such. Without every revenue from industry, you don't have a tax return. In 1941, uh, the first jet in England flew. It was only an experimental aircraft. But I'm bringing the jet because it weaves into our program in Canada later on. The first Anson flew in 1941, built by National Steel Car Company. But in 1942, they got an order for Lancasters from England. Uh, now that was rather an enormous project going from Hansons to Lancaster. And I'm going to the press here. Which one is it? Um, you can see the Lysanders and the Anson in the background. This one was flown across the Atlantic. They were the first Lancaster to fly across the Atlantic, and that was east to west crossing, which is the toughest one. Uh, it was sent over here for uh, tooling and jigging, and then went on for a war bond tour in the United States. I've been used two hands here. Can I press the button? Um, what was amazing. In 16 months from receiving the drawings, they produced, uh, National Steel Car Company produced the first Lancaster. Now there's thousands, tens of thousands of parts in Lancaster. 
I'll let me have you some contracted. But the Ruhr, Ruhr Express, and this air, uh, aircraft was named, was the first one off the line, KB-700. Now, as usual, uh, a bit like the CBC today, the National Film Board demanded this aircraft fly off the war. <coughs> so they requested a crew to look like they're flying off the war. Unfortunately, the Lancaster wasn't ready to fly across the Atlantic. It wasn't ready to be accepted by the RAF as yet. And the whole crew were all ex tours from Halifax, because they never flown in Lancaster before. Um, I met the uh, tow pilot, who was happened to be a father, and one of my friends at uh, Chalk River um, about a year or so ago. Anyway, they flew off from Malton, but they had to land again in Montreal to fix the aircraft up and finish the wiring and things that were missing. Then they got a telegram from the RAF saying, well, this is the first aircraft, it must go through acceptance tests. So that meant doing flying at various altitudes, various uh, engine powers. In doing so, one of the engines failed, and so they had to repeat the test, get a new engine from uh, Malton, which took time. It finally uh, flew the Atlantic, and it was the only Lancaster to um, join uh, out, uh, a squadron outside number six uh, group, in fact, by number pathfinders. It did quite a few operations before it met on the time the end by hitting a, um, some earth moving equipment at the end of our engine, burst of flames. Um, <coughs> the management at uh, National Steel Car Company in Malton were having great, great difficulty with the management in, Malton, in Hamilton. And so they wrote to C.D. Howe and said, we want the Lancasters, you better do something. So in typical C.D. Howe manner, he formed a crown corporation called Victory Aircraft and named his own board of directors and such. Uh, and so National Steel Car Company became Victory Aircraft. You will note in this um, slide that most of the people at the top of the wing, that's quite a lot heavy wing loading, are women. Majority, in fact, a large number presented to the workforce at uh, Victory were women. In fact, when you're building Spitfires, the only person who can assemble the tail part of the Bit far from the inside is a very small woman. Um, one man, I've tried it myself, and you can't do it. But uh, to help the girls get to the plant, they built special apartments right next door to the um, Moulton uh, Airport. Not just a moment. <laughs> Um, production then went ahead, and by 1945, um, air, uh, Victory Aircraft pushing out one Lancaster a day. You might have the logistics, assembling and having the flow of the production, with all the subcontractors required, and tens of thousands of parts required. Fleet Aircraft in Fort Erie produced the outer uh, wing panels, the uh, other part of wings and elevators and flaps, and they uh, came in under budget and under schedule. In the meantime, in 44-45, uh, I was crossing the Atlantic again to get my wings down in Florida at Cloiston at a number five BFTS British Flying Training School. The United States even before they joined the war in uh, December 41, they were training RF pilots. They go across the city to then change the uniform once you get to the United States. When they joined the war, of course, they could wear uniforms all the time. There were six British flying training schools, and they trained about oh, that's 3,000 RF pilots. Just pilots, no ground uh, crew, they had no air crew. By the time uh, I got my wings in 45, back to England, 
uh, that opened the door. So we volunteered for, I'll go back a step. Uh, one of the aircraft built by Victory was KB-726. And it only had a life of 46 hours. And that included flying across the Atlantic, going through the acceptance test in uh, England, and doing X number of operations. It got shot down while they were doing a bombing raid on the June the 13th, 13 minutes past midnight. Um, I got hit by a Junkers 88. It set fire to the left wing port, uh, wing tanks, knocked these two engines out, and also set fire to the hydraulic fluid because hydraulic fluid fed the rear gunner and the mid upper gunner. Um, the rear gunner was realizing every gun quiet and with no intercom and people bailing out. He tried to turn his turret mechanically, he had no hydraulics, but that broke and he was fixed. He couldn't get in or get out of his turret, but he technically had to turn right around at 90 degrees and bail out backwards. That's once you've got the parachute, which is sitting inside here. The Narski, the mid upper, uh, mid upper gunner, saw the problem that uh, Pat Brophy was in and crawled through the flames because you have to crawl over the main spar of the Air on the um, tailplane here. He got his um, flying suit on fire, tried very hard to get the doors open, but couldn't move the turret. Finally gave up, crawled back through the flames, saluted, and bailed it on fire. And unfortunately, the parachute worked, but he died with burns and he landed in France. Um, Pat Brophy went down with the aircraft. Um, Art the brain, the pilot, had set the aircraft into a flat angle, so when it impacted a tree that hit the ground, it flung the aircraft and flung Pat Wolfie right out of the turret, and he had no scotch on him. He lost all his hair, but that was due to a problem he had before. <laughs> <laughs> um, so unfortunately, that crawled through a cow pasture, which you know what that means in those days, uh, and get um, away from the Germans. <coughs> the crew of seven, including Monarski, who died, uh, all survived. Two were captured POW because of the bombing uh, knocked himself out of the escape hatch, which is in front here. And um, Art the Brain, the Jim Kelly, the wireless operator, and uh, Bodhi, the navigator, all escaped or made a capture and were later liberated. The um, flight engineer and the bombinger were taken um, captured by the Germans and went through that horrible march in the winter. I'm used to having uh, one. This is a rear, a rear view of the uh, rear turret. The, um, the old days, they just have perspex up here. And a lot of the rear gunners were moving their armor plating up in front of them. And so they took all the way and just made this open. And that means you have to sit eight hours in freezing cold temperature, um, four or five hours in, and three hours or more back to base. And as Pat Brophy said, the problem we had about going to the bathroom, he always used to fill his glove up and throw it overboard. <laughs> to the um, storage turret, why the door short ones up. <laughs> but I had to wear it up with suits to keep warm. And we complain about flying the aircraft seven or five uh, or eight hours compared to them. Uh, at Canadian Warping Heritage, we had the opportunity to restore uh, this aircraft, FM 213 which had been part of the air sea rescue at the end of uh, its life. We were one of the last aircraft to retire. It had been on pylons and we brought it to Hamilton and restored it. It took about nine hours, uh, nine years and five hours intensive. This is the Monarchy Bank. Colored in the same way the RA was colored 
to the door. It has uh, four Packard Merlins, 224s, and that's the only type of engine we're allowed to use. We can't use any other, other Merlin. Uh, this transport won't allow us to make aircraft and flew with that, other than Packard. First aircraft I bumped into was a good old Tiger Moth. Now this is a very modern one because it's got a tail wheel, it's got brakes, and it's deep with a canopy. Can't the canopy's not on. In England we had the skid here, no brakes, and the skid was to a brake for breaking the grass. You had to get the ground crew to turn you around by grabbing the wing and swimming around. Um, we flew that in rain, fog, no matter what. You only could see the chimney tower, you flew. And passed grading school. During the period of the war, uh, Canada became involved in the jet program, gas turbine program in England under Whittle. And they wanted to test these engines at uh, cold temperatures, so guess where they set the place up in Winnipeg. Uh, they have to set up a cold weather testing area. And so we had gas turbines here in 44 and 45 on a test way out of Winnipeg. This is one of the early jets sort of with a whittle that has a reverse has a reverse flow combustion chambers and of course a centrifugal compressor, not what you fly with today. My next aircraft I bumped into was the Stearman uh, Coulston uh, PT-17A needle aircraft into all the aerobatics in Mickelon. Uh, nothing you can't do. It's a very big aircraft, well, it's the Tiger Moth, but very strong. Uh, we have a name for our aerobatic loads are interested, where you do a flick roll. You all know what a flick roll is? Where you stall the aircraft and flex on its back. Well, instead of carrying on and doing the full flick roll, we push the stick in the opposite end and this shoots you out of the cockpit, especially with loose uh, harnesses. And we used to call it steam ships. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the instructor used to uh, guide us nuts sometimes. They uh, were all civilian instructors there, it was a civilian school. And now and again, they get bored. We used to have B 17s coming down into our area. And they get the pilot to feather two of the engines and then tuck the harbor. In the, uh, behind the wing and then fly over the wing, down below the wing, and back up again. Or taking the um, steerman along the gravel road and touching top of a bus and then land in front of it and then take off again. <laughs> so it, it kept you amused. <laughs> um, from the Uh, Stearman, so we went to the Texan, which is where the harbor came from. Uh, the Texan was American, North American P-86A, and from that, the RAF and the RCF modified it to suit their requirements. Number one, the flying instrument had to be standardized with quite a few other changes. The nose exhaust is quite different. The radio mast is the same place. Ours used to be here. On our Texans. That's a very powerful aircraft and very unforgiving. And you can run with it very easily. Um, but it did qualify you to go from there to a fighter. Um, when we got, as I said, when we got back to England in 45, we day was declared. So we volunteered for the fleet air arm to go on to Corsairs to join the Tiger Force to go up to Japan. We were in the uh, Navy for three weeks and that war was over, so they got rid of us by sending us back to the RAF. Um, the RAF gave us the option of converting to twins or be grounded, of course, we were to twins. It didn't fly exactly this aircraft, but a very similar one, the Airstreet Oxford. This is a Cessna crane, which again was done to use for uh, twin engine training. And then in Christmas 45, we got shipped out to India. Uh, 
And we didn't complain. I don't remember any grumbling about it. Did we grumble and no, ship that piece of this? This is a technically a, a DC-3, painted like a Dakota, but it's the second oldest one still flying in the world. It's over 80,000 iron. The reason uh, is that the DC-3 has a passenger door here, where the Dakota has a freight door where we used to dump supplies of it, and there's quite a few differences in the carry over about 30 odd people. It took us 10 days to fly out to India. Um, we flew and flew at daytime, stopping at Sardinia, West Africa, Palestine, Iraq in those days, belonged to the RAF, uh, Havana, and then Bahrain, and finally Karachi. Um, this was the day before partition, and we, what we ended up doing is based in New Delhi, we supply the air routes from New Delhi, Jodhpur, Karachi, Karachi, Bombay, Bombay, Cochin, to Bangalore, and down to Nagumbo and Salon, and back up. And same to Calcutta, Dum Dum. That's where the Dum Dum bullet comes from, is the, the name of the aircraft, uh, airport, Calcutta. Down to Vizagratan, Madras, Bangalore, Gumbo. While we were there, we were asked to uh, drop supplies at the Chinese Tibetan border way up in Assam here. And it was deemed so dangerous, they counted it as post war operations. And we survived. Uh, we used an old hump route here for air food. And before we left, the old enough in flames, we were the party. This is in 46-47. Um, a uh, number of things have happened now. <coughs> Sir Roy Dobson, um, Roy Dobson, as you've known then, had decided that Canada had been so successful in building Lancaster that he should buy the plant and turn it into Avril. And so he negotiated in 45 um, with um, City Howe, and the agreement was. If they can make a profit, they pay the rent, pay out the cost of the building. If they couldn't make a profit, there would be no rent charge. But what was amazing, three years later, they paid off the whole cost of buying the Havre plant. That's where McDonald Douglas was, where Boeing is today. Uh, while we were up in India, we flew Anson's. This is a Canadian Anson, came from Canadian Water and Heritage. It's a wooden one. It's a wooden construction compared to the steel and canvas of the other engines. It built a bit like a mosquito. And while I was there, I had a chance to fly a Spitfire. Unfortunately, my second trip had to be 1,200 miles. Uh, the seal said, you fly that Spitfire, and you fly it 1,200 miles up to Ambala. Well, I really did and survived. The Mark 8, beautiful aircraft, fly. I came into land the first time and mentally said, well, this is a high-speed fighter, must be faster than the harbor. So I came in slightly faster than the harbor. What I didn't know was a, a Spitfire with no load on, no ammunition, and this sort of thing. It stalls a lot lower than the harbor. So I floated down one way five times before I finally touched down. <laughs> My ground crew clapped, uh, so that's five landings. <laughs> Um, one of the big things that uh, Ira first turned to was converting Lancasters to civilian duty, uh, both photographic, navigational. In fact, they did the photographs of the um, Park to Canada that we surveyed before. And this is the last where uh, the Lancasters have been converted to civilian use, still in the RCF, but uh, now no longer aggressive. And so they were searching for work to fill this plant. And one of the first orders I got was for a fighter. Initially, they were going to build a trainer and I got canceled it. And they started up a um, prototype construction of a CF-100. In those days, they hand-built the um, prototype. As there was no production parts available. And so each part had to be built by hand. The jig. 
assembly. At the same time, they um, had gone ahead and gained the city how had decided that the coal weather station form a, a gas turbine design unit called Turbo Research, in Crown Corporation. And whenever I bought the property, they absorbed the turbo research gas turbine into the engine division. This group here designed the Chinook, the first gas turbine, designed and built in Canada, and this is the design team behind here. It's one of the only experimental gas turbine that proved we could build gas turbines. And this carried, the Rinda series carried on to you got to the Rinda 14, which was the last of the Rinda series. At the same time, um, they rebuilt the jetliner. This is a long shot of it. All my other slides are with my book, which is sitting with publishers, so I have my classical slides with me of the jetliner. And we'll go to left over. This is the first jetliner way ahead mm -hmm. of the 707. Let me read out the numbers. If I can remember them. The um, jetliner flew two weeks after the Department Kong, which was quite amazing. I mean, this was First aircraft that uh, Avro Canada had built and started in Canada. The 707, the Boeing 707, didn't get going until 54. This was in the late 40s. First flight of the 707 didn't occur until 54 and didn't go into service until 58. So you see the length of time it takes. For example, Concorde, 1969. In service, 1976. When you build an aircraft, it takes a lot of time to get all the kinks out of it. As I mentioned before, the final payment in 48 for the molten facilities. And the first jet, CF 100, flew in um, 1950. Uh, they had to bring a test pilot over from England. Bill Wharton, on a side issue here, in my CF100 book, I quoted uh, the behavior of Bill uh, Wharton, but he happened to like it. So when I attended a recent uh, aeronautical um, conference, he refused to come because he knew I was going to be there. The reason uh, he got um, a bad name, or he tended to be rather um, domineering, I only flew when he wanted to fly. So when he left, the um, other pilots found they get four or five flights in a day when we only do two or three. So it's in a moment. As I mentioned, the uh, Chinook uh, also ran in 48. There's a goal of this period from 1945. We haven't even got to 1950, just got to 1950. <coughs> Unfortunately, the jetliner had a very poor history as um, though it was very successful, we never put in production and finished, and we weren't allowed to build another one. It was funded by the government. The government said the Korean War is more important, we want to see up 100 off the line as fast as you can do. So drop the jetliner and concentrate on CF 100. So that was done. Um, This is the second prototype, which is a wee bit different from the first. It has the um, long range tanks on the wing tip. These cannot be jet You have to take them up manually on the ground. Unfortunately, they lost this aircraft while I was practicing high altitude, long distance flying to fly the Atlantic to go to the primary air show. The assumption is um, 
both of the crew lost their oxygen. Uh, in those days, the oxygen systems were still World War II type. We're now flying pretty consistently over 3,000, 35,000 feet. And when you lose your oxygen, something happens, and you quickly lose consciousness. And this aircraft just went straight to the ground and killed the crew. Before they allow the um, arenda to be used in any other aircraft, uh, because the first two prototypes, the CF 100, used A bombs, and uh, the arenda was finally had to be test flown and they converted to Lancaster. Um, they used to frighten the um, commercial pilots at that time. They used to feather these two props here and fly by the, the civilian airliners with no engines that were here. So once they had flown it, they found that they married it with a Sabre, a North American Sabre, F 86. They had an excellent aircraft. So the Rendo was put on the um, Sabre. And much to the Americans' displeasure, for two years, uh, the RCF in uh, North and uh, NATO in Europe had the best Sabres in the world. They were for two solid years, they had complete supremacy in both speed, climb, and such, because the render had more thrust and like lighter weight than the American engine. Uh, when I came back from India, I uh, went to Loughborough, and I decided to carry on flying. I found flying Tiger Moss wasn't much fun. So I joined the Royal Auxiliary Air Force at uh, Winesville, the city of Nottingham. And we had these um, Spit 22s, which are a completely different beast compared to the Mark 8 I flew in uh, India. But now you have 2,300 horsepower, uh, it was 47 liters, so 47,000 liters, 47,000 cc's of engine. It was so powerful with the five bladed prop, which when it was parallel with the ground, only had eight inch clearance between the ground went on its wheels. And the aircraft wanted to turn over on its back. The torque from the engine was so great. And we pumped up the right over the leg, twice the pressure of the left. But in doing so, the aircraft still bottomed out. And it went bang, bang, bang. And we were crying across the runway to the right, and finally took off and of course every shot off the left. <laughs> and the child being a pallet and he went off and shot around to the left. Once you got in the air, the terrific aircraft, over 400 miles an hour, the Yankees to trim it, had quite a different wing from the early Spit, from the latest development of the um, Spitfire. And much to our surprise, we got told them to take them away to the MU, and we were given jets, just like that overnight. And we were the first Royal Auxiliary Air Squadron to get jets in the RAF at Winesville. This is the Gloucester Meteor, and uh, this is 4950. We had two engines, one person, four cannons, and that was it. But now, we don't think anything of flying 12 or 14 hours with X hundred people aboard. And that's the difference in 50 years or 51 years of development by engineers. The big difference we noticed, we felt naked. We don't, didn't have an engine in front of us. All we had was the bottom of the windscreen as a visible indication, and there was nothing else. You couldn't see the wing unless you really cranked your head around. And you realize that the first thing you're going to hit was you. <laughs> and you always had the feeling you had an engine prop in front of you, you had more protection. But actual fact, the engine always came back to the back. It was a beautiful aircraft to fly, except it was very thirsty. We had 43 minutes flying time max if we got up to 30, 25, 40,000 feet. If you stayed below 20,000 or 10,000, you had 20 minutes. Um, we did use them, the um, F3s, these are F4s, uh, against the um, buzz bombs, but they never took part uh, in any um, air combat. The big problem you have to learn is slow down. Well, there's no prop to slow you down, no nothing. But we had beautiful die brakes on the wing here, and the slam those out in that brake. So you could play the 
you can turn over your back at 30,000 feet, put your air brakes out, and dive straight down to the ground. And they had a terminal velocity which you could pull out. Beautiful sensation. Long to make it pull out. <laughs> <laughs> Um, when they took over the um, gas turbine division, they also took over Nobel, the test establishment, up in uh, near Paris Sound. Do you know where Nobel is? Uh, it's no longer there. It's all gone. It used to be. It used to be a, a, an ammunition cordite, uh, an ammunition factory for wartime, and they tore all well, they burnt all the. Um, hot down, but left the acid tires and the powerhouse, and we used the turbine and the powerhouse to turn the compressors, to test the compressors for the air crawl and Renda. And we had all our test cells here as well. Plus, there's houses at Nobel, and we used to walk in the wintertime from there through the woods, across the tracks, to here, because I one of my experiments required all the air compressed air available on the planet. Beautiful village. There's no longer there, it's all gone. <coughs> anyway, Renda uh, used over 3,000 um, engines, and this is where they lined up waiting for part. Uh, they couldn't deliver for a shortage of one part. The C100 went through various marks and uh, did various experimental work. Uh, this is with the velvet glove. Now, a good example of that design. Because every time you fire these rockets, the exhaust goes into the engine, the engine chokes, and it blows your flame out. And uh, when they will see later, uh, later on, they put the spirals out on the hard points out here. But it's a typical example of that design, thinking far enough forward. This is the Mark III, which was used up in North Bay for training. And there's the render being changed. We have one of these old cranes at CWH, which is a real uh, museum piece. <coughs> now, Mark IV uh, really became the true aircraft, the development of the uh, CF 100. It had uh, four. 0.5 inch, sorry, 8.5 inch machine guns and a pack here, and then later on you see the rocket pod to go to winter. It had a crew of two, one was the pilot and one was the navigator. Uh, we sent three squadrons over to Europe in camouflage. I was going to use this for the front cover of the CF 100 book, decided to tube much of a public statement and they get the best comments upset. So we put it on the back. <laughs> and you'll notice way back in all of them, this is where the um, Museum of Civilization is now. The mm -hmm. Eddy Match is gone. And this whole area has changed. Uh, I mentioned air brakes and meteors. On the CR 100, they're rather unusual or serrated. And had both a choice of top and bottom, and they were just bottom. The game, you can see the eight machine gun. Um, a lot of people don't realize that more often than not, uh, armaments are more dangerous to your side than to the enemy. Uh, the reason for that, this is the fire of the eight machine guns, and you see the amount of steel uh, coming off the bullets from the right hand. A while we're doing air testing and gun, gunner tests in Lake Ontario, two aircraft shot themselves down. So what was happening, they were using rather low ammunition. There were some fast bullets and some slow bullets. And the fast bullets knocked the slow bullets out of, out of the way, and of course went straight into the engine. The engine shattered, and of course the aircraft had to return to base. <clears throat> and both aircraft ended up with one engine on uh, the rockets were rather spectacular. They had a plastic dome in the front and a plastic tail. And when the um, 
navigator had locked onto the target, pressed the button, all uh, rockets fired in a ripple. You see them flying up here. They're folding fin rockets. That meant the fins are folded when there's a tube here and they come spring out. But those fins tend to bend. In one case, a rocket went up, round and back through the wing of the aircraft shot. Uh, now and again, the rockets used to go off on the ground and uh, create havoc to aircraft taking off. And in one case, the squadron said sort of, you missed me, uh, but they ended up in the tail of the other aircraft. The idea was to, to saturate the target area, which was supposed to be the Russian bombers. While this was going on, there was negotiations across 1953 for both uh, by Arenda to build an engine and the um, replacement aircraft for the CF-100, which would be the final became the Arrow. But the point I can make is that Arenda started the Iroquois engine, the private venture, way before the Arrow was even authorized. And the CBC did Canada to service by poo pooing the problems that Arenda had with the Iroquois. In fact, you know, to hear later, the Iroquois flew better than the Arrow at times. There's a story behind this picture. This is a NORAD um, self defense force. The Canadians have the CF 100, which fly in all weather, night and day. The Americans didn't have one, they had its own the day fighter. The friend of mine who was doing the design of the book. Was working at uh, Gander on the radar when Khrushchev was coming across the United Nations to do his death pumping. Uh, well, the Americans didn't believe that the Russians could fly from Moscow to New York non stop, so they assumed they were going to come to Gander to refuel. But there was no sign of them on the radar. And they kept on, NORAD kept on falling up, seeing indication, no. Oh. And all of a sudden, up on the radar came three blips heading straight from New York. So between the um, Foreign Affairs of the State Department and NORAD got their messages across. So they scrambled these fighters to intercept these three blips. And they got up there and said, the Russians, now what do I do? By that time, uh, the government had got things sorted out. So don't shoot, it's Khrushchev. And of course, they came straight to the land. So that's the time we shot Khrushchev. <coughs> So the idea of well, the instructions in those days for engagement was if it's Russian and it's breaking our airspace, you would fire and think about it later. So the negotiations uh, of what the specification should be for the replacement of the um, CF-100 was the Avro Arrow that became known on the CF-15, and a big difference um, was the specification and also the method of construction. It was decided to speed everything up. They would build the arrows from day one on production jigs. So any changes that occurred from the <coughs> SAF, which did have quite a few changes, and from the uh, designers, rippled down the course of production line. On the line with there were 37 aircraft in various stages of construction. This is a wood, uh, metal mock-up. Before that, there was a wooden mock-up. This is metal to make sure all parts fit uh, before they go into the jigging. This is the first aircraft, uh, 201 on the line there. The specification for the Arrow was very advanced, in fact, uh, out of this world. Um, I don't know if you realize that as you go higher and higher in the atmosphere, your stalling speed of the aircraft you're flying in, particularly your airliner, increases and increases. So when you're up to 35, 39,000 feet, your stalling speed will come way up in numbers. At the same time, you're losing power from the engines because the air is getting thinner and thinner. So you end up with a, and compressibility comes into it, the pilots end up with a stalling speed maximum power of possibility, that's the range you can fly, fly in. When you turn an aircraft, you tend to lose power. 
the use of potentially with high efficiency and the show that can power them. So the um, arrow had a specification, it had to pull a 2G turn, I mean twice the force of gravity, at 50,000 feet without losing height or speed. That means you had to have extra power available to do that because um, the aircraft loses speed when you do a turn. Um, the arrow, fun enough, had the same wingspan as the Lysander, 50 feet, but <laughs> a lot longer <laughs> and a lot bigger. I pushed. Um, as I mentioned, the Iroquois was way ahead of the Arrow, and in fact, had already run at full power before the Arrow ever flew. Um, and later on, uh, when Black Friday, Black, Black Friday came, cancellation, the render Iroquois was flying, flying, but running, in a high, high altitude test facility at 50,000 feet at Mach 2.3. In, uh, this is where the air is thinned by the tunnel and um, put the uh, uh, engine heats the air as well and puts the engine under high altitude, high speed conditions. So it was very successful compared to what the CBC said. And we had no women in higher, uh, higher management than I wrote. Um, Brenda also introduced titanium. Uh, Two engines. At that time, all the blades in the previous engines were either steel or aluminum. And as we went to higher and higher powers and velocity, which was not for 2 2.3, the initial blades in the, high, the LP compressor were made of titanium and the rest of steel. And the turbines back here. Two spool engines, uh, very similar to Olympus. In fact, we sent an engine after cancellation, over the Bristol engines, to assist in the uh, Olympus development. This, this is titanium again, the sheeting here covering up the accessories, as is the pumps are underneath there as well. Um, a lot of people question me, didn't the Americans cancel the um, Arrow? And I say no, just the opposite. Number one, they gave us everything we asked for. In those days, high-speed wind tunnels were as scarce as hen's teeth. Uh, the war is cute, <coughs> and it was trying to um, get to higher and higher speeds. They gave us the wind tunnel time. They let us have a B-47, a strategic bomber in those days. They allowed our crew to go down and be trained as a full crew at a sack base. Nobody else in the world has ever done that except Americans. Then we brought it back to Canada Air, who adapted and the cell for the aircraft. And you see the size of the engine compared to what the B 47 has peanuts. Um, it flew twice with the aircraft. The trouble was that the aircraft was so powerful, they uh, had to shut down X number of engines, but they had to keep some room for electrics and hydraulics. The B 47s allows the aircraft to fly, uh, and it had a very flexible wing. It was a very good aircraft for what it was designed for, a street bomber, but if you got out of the wrong, in the wrong angle or the wrong dive, sometimes you couldn't get out of it. But it was very hard to land because it had a tandem undercarriage with outriggers when you get around, and so it had a very flat angle you had to come in at. If you came in too steep, you couldn't make it, you came in too shallow. But it served our purpose. Again, that was flying before the arrow was cancelled. On the first flight, well, now we're getting into the arrow program properly. Um, the Korean War has been, has been over, so the CF 100 had. Um, Met its requirement, never saw, never fired an anger in my view that went to Korea. Um, I never saw an arrow, as I was up at Novell, and in 58, 
just as the uh, arrows starting to fly, I got posted to Chope River, Atomic Energy. And later on, Atomic Energy asked me to join them. On the first flight, we didn't retract the undercarriage. This was rather a very long, thin undercarriage because it had to fit into a very thin wing. A lot of people don't appreciate the number of firsts that had to be developed for this aircraft. For example, the hydraulics, because they had to fit inside a thin wing, and all the controls were hydraulically operated and operated from computer signals from the pilot's um, control column, we had to develop a 4,000 PSI hydraulic system. Well, the B-1 bomber, X decades later, finally ended up with a 4,000 PSI hydraulic system. These undercarriages were a bit of a problem because they both had to rotate to fit back in the wing when they were, they were retracted, plus the length had to be shortened to fit into the space. And the Jan Zero test had a bit of a problem with that on one of his landings. Uh, this is the next couple of flights, we've got the undercarriage up. The weapons bay, which is the part here, Again, the Arrow was one of the leading aircraft to have all the weapons inside the aircraft, so it would not, not be a drag. Lousy radar, and they have a beautiful radar signature. It will not be stealth whatsoever. That's a flat side, and that's a beautiful reflection of the um, radar, plus the tail. That would come later, because you could conform, put conformal fillets and more um, fuel tanks underneath the wing there. That's 201. Five aircraft were flown uh, before cancellation. This is 202. Now, think of scrambling, running up that ladder and getting to the cockpit, which is a clamshell, but you have to step around and climb over your ejection seat and make sure you get in, the navigator gets in before you get in, doesn't pull the cord on you. Uh, on the CF 100, in the pilot's notes, there's a graphic cartoon showing the pilot being shot out by the uh, navigator pulling his uh, ejection seat. So uh, the arrow designed for the pilot to sit in the aircraft, ready to go. Uh, the engines, the gear, the aircraft was designed to be up to uh, full um, speed for taxiing in 50 seconds and go the full power and afterburn about two and a half. Uh, that a terrific acceleration. But the air, the air for our post never flew with the arrow. It was J75. The um, reason for J75 was every time they chose a, a, an engine for the arrow, the manufacturers of that engine either dropped it or was never going to uh, proceed into production. And so they searched the world for an engine to find the arrow. So they had to back off finally and use J75 to act. This is a 203, third aircraft. A lot of the testing was done in the winter time, as you can see. And one of the big problems the ground crew had in the early um, aircraft were the very high pressure um, tires. And with the braking, which wasn't too good at the time, overheated, increased the pressure in the wheels. When it tacks it in and again, the wheels would explode. Then you had these bits of rubber, like rubber bullets, flying around. So all the ground crews used to hide behind trucks and this thing and wait till things cooled off before they approached the aircraft. They finally solved that problem by redesigning the braking system so they didn't glow hot red. They again using discs. On the end meteors, we had drum, which were very good. 204, uh, you can see the size of the um, jet pipes and the height of the aircraft on the ground. This composite piece here was made by Fleet, one of the first composite um, parts made in Canada. And the exhaust from the air conditioning plant came up back here. The air conditioning works so well sometimes, one point, one of the pilots 
was frozen so stiff that he couldn't get it to stop being cold. Uh, he froze in his seat, and he had to get his grab crew to come pull out. He couldn't move his legs, and he lifted him the cup. Because when you're strapped in an aircraft, nothing you can do if legs don't work, you're stuck. Um, again, it shows the height. This thing here in front, these probes, control the computers. And we're using computer control. It's the first, one of the first fly-by-wire aircraft in the world. In those days, we were using valve-type computers, not the microchips you know today. They were valve, they were like the old radios with a valve shoot. They were all mounted in the uh, <coughs> weapons bay. And the pilot would signal what he wanted to do by a strain gauge on his control stick. The signal would go to the computer, half of the computer and half of the control. The computer didn't decide what the aircraft could or could not do. If he pulled too much G, he would just say, no, you can't do that. Or well, if he did something uh, different from what the aircraft designed for, the computer would override the control, the set control as it should be. It worked very well. A few surprises, of course, occurred uh, between the automatic and the manual system. Here's what we call a crew of arrows, there's three of them in the line, 201, 202, and it's 203 at the back. And it's summertime ones. The arrow got up to 1.98 Mach number in its flight program. Um, it designed for Mach 2, and that's when it was supposed to do its specification test of turning. That 1.98 was in with the lower thrust of Jason 5 and the climbing altitude too. So it wasn't that big. This was Spud Podoki having a bit of a problem with the brakes. Um, when you're flying an aircraft, most, most uh, pilots do this, you tend to, as you touch down, you peck the brakes, depending whether you're foot controlled or hand controlled, to see if they're working. And see if it gets dried, and then once the air, you are no, you're on the ground, you've got the brakes working, and you put them on. <coughs> well, Spud had landed as he thought, but the, the computer decided to drop the Evalons a wee bit until the aircraft lifted off the weight off the wheels. All the wheels were on the ground, there was no weight on the wheels. So when he packed the brakes, he couldn't think any effect. So he packed them again. No effect. The aircraft finally stalled. This time, he had the wheels locked, and of course, it just machined them right in half. They went one way. Um, the one on the carriage collapsed. This aircraft was repaired and back in the air again in the next couple of months. We're moving it down. In this case, there's the air brakes on the arrow, quite different. Two big panels come down the fuselage. And a very um, elaborate intake to stop the shock waves interfering with the engine. There's a boundary air bleed and everything else in there. And there's certain cooling air um, dumping and also flaps inside the tunnel. Can I press the button? 205 was the fifth and last aircraft to fly. <clears throat> we got in trouble in the book we did on the Arrow because there were no um, still photographs taken of the 205 while it was flying. So we had to use movie film frames to make up uh, still photographs. On the initial edition, we didn't mention that. And on the second edition, I did. The um, weapons bay, you can see it here, would be winched up by these cables, locked in place, and the trolley then would be dropped. And so you could change over your uh, missiles and rearm in a very short period of time. And again, you can see how thin the wing is for the high speed. And there's the flaps, and you get everyone's. So this picture of 205 is artificial. What we did was took that picture of 201, uh, put five instead of one, put the dago on it, and that's what you can do 
don't believe in photographs sometimes. Uh, it certainly had the effect of speaking on all the calendars. So this is a movie film frame of 205 taxi. Here's the, um, just to slow the aircraft down, as it had such a thin wing, the air brakes won't do much in throwing a, a, such a high speed aircraft. And they touched down at quite a high uh, rate of knots. And a drag shoe. Now this was designed by a woman, a friend of mine at uh, Atomic Energy, his wife, who wrote the book, There Never Was an Arrow. She was in charge of the design of the drag shoe and mechanism, which is in the tail here. So there were, there were female engineers in Avro, but not senior ones, as the CBC suggested it was. The um, notched, this, this sort of aerodynamics has now gone out of uh, phase, and there was a so-called Coke bottle aerodynamics, I won't go into it right now, kind of elaborate thing to describe as a drawing a blackboard. But you can see the beautiful delta wing. Two hundred six was going to be the first aircraft with the Iroquois engine. They were fitting them actually in the aircraft. The two engines had been um, qualified for flight, had been delivered to Avro when Black Friday came along in fifty nine and the cancellation. But this time I was in Chopper um, for Atomic Energy, so I wasn't fired. I was no longer on the hour program on the aircraft program. But heavy else got fired. Massively. Um, a lot of people say why. Um, there's a whole series of reasons, complicated with politics, which you can never understand when you review it. Stephen Baker didn't like the arrow, it was very expensive. But of course, the government, his government and future government, all spent more money on replacement aircraft than they would ever spend on the arrow, the aircraft program. The Americans offered to money for extra squadrons of the arrow, but the government turned it down, didn't want to be embarrassed. That's the memo recording that offer to the government. Uh, they also offered the weapon system, which the RCF didn't want. They wanted the most advanced system that wasn't available. But they offered free of charge. Again, the Ministry of Defense refused to acknowledge that offer. So there's a whole series of things. You can't blame the Americans for cancellation of the arrow. There was, of course, the weapons for changing. The ICBMs just come in, Sputnik. Um, people were saying no longer needed um, fighter aircraft. Or fighter bombers. Of course, as you know, today we're using nothing else but fighter bombers. Because of the Kosovo, Gulf War and you know, Afghanistan. So that mixed up the politics uh, with missiles. But um, <clears throat> the Americans did do a, <clears throat> a snow job on us. They <laughs> saw the people they were into taking on Bomar. And you've got to remember. This is the height of the Cold War, and uh, everybody was very nervous about the way the Russian bombers were nibbling away at our airspace, and especially when you're going down to Cuba. Um, so, frontline fighting of the um, airspace was the thing. So, they sold us these Bomarks. Now, these are the Bomark B. The A had a normal warhead, the B was designed only for nuclear war. So what happened? We, for two years, we had bow marks with no warheads. We <laughs> <laughs> finally we accepted nuclear weapons, and the Americans demand then you have a little space beside each bow mark, which is uh, manned by an American soldier. And that piece of space is American. That any maintenance of the warhead has to be done on American soil and guarded by Americans. Nobody else can get hold of the weapon. They were useless. Um, I went up to North Bay with a group of professional engineers for a visit, both in NORAD, where they had the hole uh, in the ground of North Bay, 
And they were going to demonstrate the bow mark to us. Well, they, the design they had in the North Bay is not like this. They had sliding doors which went left and right. And if you got those doors open, then the roof could come off and then the bird could come vertical. It was the middle of winter and the ice had frozen on the rails on the garage doors at the bottom. So there was 30 engineers chipping away at the ice <laughs> of any aircraft that had been invaded so we'd gone away fast. Completely <laughs> uh, senseless, not designed for our weather condition. And it was a bit, um, American never, never uh, deployed it because they, like, they didn't like it either. But they sold it to us. And that was one thing we got taken to for a ride. And that was deep in the the, after cancellation, the only project that carried on was the Avocar. All my other slides of the Avocar with the publisher. So I only have this one left out of the group. Um, John Frost, who was originally on the um, CF100, got taken off and left, left to play with his ideas of future flying. And what he wanted to do was have a flying saucer. And he went through some ridiculous um, approaches to it. Finally, got the Americans sucked into it and they funded it. The federal government funded some of it, but the American Air Force and Army funded the two aircraft carriers that were built and some of the testing was done in, uh, out in California. Another good example of design mistakes these intakes for the three little jet engines were originally down here in the first project. So when they started up, all the dust and straw and everything else got sucked into the engine. The engine don't like dirt and um, foreign objects. The other thing, the pilot said, don't give us um, ejection seats. We can slam the throttles closed and jump out and next seconds it takes to go off in the ejection seat. They took the campies off, made them crash for them. This was a completely useless uh, vehicle, a social research vehicle, completely unstable. Uh, everybody who looked at it from the physics and the aerodynamic side said it was actually uh, silly to even try to do it because the circle was the hardest thing to fly with. And so all it did was to wobble along the ground. They're very unstable. Some of the pilots could get reasonably stable. And was along, but you had no brakes. You know, if you want to turn, you drifted slowly to the left as you drifted down to the right. They modified it heavily, trying to get better stability, but they couldn't solve it. It was completely unstable, had no solution. One was taken all the way down by the canal through Toronto at night, down the canal to New York, and around the um, um, Panama Canal. To, uh, California, they were putting a wind tunnel. And they tried, Americans tried very hard to improve the stability, but finally, sort of report that it was hopeless. Uh, forget it. So he dropped it. That was the last project that uh, Avro worked on. So Avro disappeared. Avro Canada aircraft. Um, Arenda engines stayed on. The Havans got talked into taking on the big agro um, complex. And after about a couple of years, decided it wasn't their business, it was the wrong business. And McDonnell Douglas uh, took it over and became McDonnell Douglas Canada, building the wake wings for the DC-9s. And of course now Boeing is taking McDonnell Douglas, and Boeing is thinking very seriously of closing the plant because DC-9s and MD-90s of going out of service. Um, so what happened? We started to build at Canada Air all the fighters rather than Avro. The first thing the Americans did was sell us second-hand Voodoo's. And we got the same weapon system the Voodoo's as the RCF turned down for the Avro. And the, um, then we had the Starfighter, and this is the engine the J-7 79 for the Starfighter and the little J85 for the Freedom Fighter. So Arenda was building 
engines by other manufacturers and carrying errors building aircraft on the license by other manufacturers, such as the uh, Sabre Starfighter and the Cheer. Here's an the engine on the test. This tube here is for starting the air motor there to spin the engine up from electric. Uh, and it also went into gas, uh, industrial gas turbines and um, were quite successful. In fact, uh, sold some to Hydro, which are used for emergency startup and pickling, uh, used for um, at oil fields, gas pipelines, and some are still running today at thousands of hours a running. Um, but again, they dropped out of that program at the time. And the Avro Verenda name has changed over the years and now part of the Magellan Aerospace Complex. The CF 100s are retired, and these were the last to be retired. They were the last um, use of the CF 100 was ECM, electric counter modules. They took all the weapons out and put in. Um, very heavy um, transmitters to jam radar, which is drive the radar people nuts. This one aircraft here is now at our museum in Hamilton and flew over Hampton Airport when we had the CF 100 book opening. Uh, this was, these were painted up without well, permission of the DND, Ottawa, and the CO got told off. But by that time they were painted, they couldn't have been so you painted one in the original prototype colors, one in the camouflage of NATO, and the other one was silver. Um, recently, uh, Renda has gone from making, I mean, making parts for other people's engines and repairs, they have gone into building what I call the piston driven horror, uh, we used to call the piston driven aircraft. It's a V8, V it's a, a Formula One Chev engine adapted and modified, heavy modified for aircraft use, and a 600 horsepower with supercharging. It fits, fits a niche between the radio engines, which are now dying, because nobody else makes radio engines anymore, and not repairing them anymore, so all people radio engines have great difficulty finding replacement. And the turboprop, which is kind of expensive and a bit more powerful. This fits in between radio engines and the prop. But it also gains in having lighter weight and also more power as you climb, having supercharging and better fuel consumption. So it's giving the turbo prop people at the back end of their um, range quite a bit of competition. Quite a number of aircraft have been qualified now to use this air engine and are also flying. So Renda is still going. That's the end. <laughs> <laughs>